Good morning, FS201. Happy Friday. Hope everybody had a great week and is heading into the weekend. Um, some announcements to start out with. Your pack back question and two responses are due today by 11.59. That's Friday, April 17th. Your last Quizam, that's the very last one, opens today and is due next Wednesday, April 22nd by 11.59 p.m. So Quizam 13 is the last one. You have one more pack back submission after today, and that's going to be that last Friday of class, April 24th. Don't forget your final exam opens that same day, April 24th, and closes Wednesday, April 29th. So don't wait till the last day or two to take this. Make sure you are taking it in advance so that if you do have problems or technical difficulties, uh, we can get those sorted out before that due date. There will not be any extensions. Please keep that in mind. Um, so if you have technical difficulties, say you have to drive to a hotspot in order to have enough internet to take the exam, um, please contact me, let me know. Do that in advance and maybe we can work out um, some kind of, of way to deal with this so that it's not quite as stressful um, for taking the exam. If you have technical difficulties while you're taking the exam that you did not plan on and that you didn't know about in advance, feel free to contact me immediately. Um, I will be sending you guys my cell phone number so that you can contact me if something like that does happen. All right, so what are we doing now? So we're wrapping up the semester. We have four, this not including today, we have three more lectures. Um, so we've got some guest speakers coming in to, to look at things, but the next couple of lectures are going to be a review of what all the different topics we've talked about. So everything from food processing, food engineering, marketing, chemistry, microbiology, food preservation, all of these things we're going to try to wrap up and look at and with some a couple of different products. Okay, um, And then the last week of class, is going to be about new frontiers in food science. We've got a great lecture um, that was will be given by um, a uh, person who got their PhD here at NC State who is now working in um, the world of food waste and looking at food waste and, and trying to minimize that at the farm level. Her name is Dr. Lisa Johnson, and she has some really interesting and exciting information to give you um, regarding reduction of food waste, which is really one of um, the up-and-coming topics in food science and focused on sustainability particularly. And, and there's two sides to that. There's consumer waste on one side, and there's also farm waste on the other. And that farm waste side um, hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention, attention to date, but Lisa is trying to remedy that. Um, we've also got some interesting information about new alternative uh, meat products that are created with plant proteins. So we've got some, some good information on that. And then there's also going to be um, a podcast instead of a lecture that I want you to listen to that's dealing with COVID-19 and how that's affecting food manufacturing in particular. So we've been in this in the United States for at least a month now, and we're really starting to see how this is affecting food manufacturing. This is not a foodborne illness, but it is altering the way that that we um, are handling all the people that have to um, be in a plant that can't social distance in a food processing plant and how that works. So um, that podcast will be on the list instead of a lecture, and I'll make sure to communicate that information to you. So today we're going to review all the different things we've done in a Food Science FS201, and we're going to use condiments as our product. So it's getting to be warmer outside. There's nice sunshine. Um, you might be thinking about having a burger every now and then. If you don't have a grill available to you, um, you might be thinking run, of running down to your local cookout and grabbing some burgers. We were actually talking about burgers and fries the other day um, and how much we would love to have some good burgers and fries and cookouts a great place to do that. Um, so whether you're doing it in your backyard or whether you're running to the store and picking uh, up something from a restaurant, uh, burgers and hot dogs are some of our favorite things to cook out on the grill. I know a lot of people like steaks and ribs as well. So what do we like on our burger? There's the typical things, the typical produce items, onions, um, tomato, lettuce, those types of things. A lot of people like cheese on their burgers. 
But there's always some type of sauce, some type of condiment on there as well. Ketchup, mustard, steak sauce. I know my daughter really loves mayo on a burger. Um, my husband prefers mustard. So there's lots of different sauces that you can put on your burger. Well, I think everybody typically thinks of ketchup, especially when you're starting to talk about french fries as well. But this is some data that you can see from around 2000 to 2013. And you can see that mayonnaise was the dominant preference in um, the United States market for condiments. Ketchup is a close second. And then there's lots of other um, toppings that you can, sauces you can add, soy sauce, barbecue sauce, hot sauce, mustard, steak sauce, lots of different ones. But mayo and ketchup are the top two. Um, and we're going to focus on ketchup. And ke the reason is that ketchup has had a very long history um, in our world globally. Ketchup, originally the first written documentation of it with recipes and maybe including um, the words, the, the, the thoughts about a sauce like ketchup started off in Asia, particularly in China. And this sauce was really at its core fish sauce. Because keep in mind, tomatoes are a product of North America, right? This is where tomatoes originated and were grown um, come from originally. So China didn't really have tomatoes to make ketchup with. So the first sauce, condiment sauces, were really fish sauces. Um, and we see that starting off here. And if you're not familiar with fish sauce, fish sauce is taking fish and allow it to ferment. It's usually pretty spicy, uh, or I'm sorry, it's pretty salty. And it also has quite a bit of um, umami uh, basic taste to it. So it can add a lot of punch to food. It can really amp up a lot of different foods and you don't need that much. It's a very potent flavor um, to have. So this was actually documented way back in Roman and Greek history and they put fish sauce on everything, including desserts. It was used lots and lots of places in almost all foods. So as migration happens and trade happens, we start to move to Europe and they discover fish sauce, but now they're adding in their own ingredients. And this is where we start to see additions like mushroom. So much mushroom ketchup became um, dominant in Europe. Uh, so this became a thicker product, still with those umami-based um, tastes that we are trying to add to foods to really enhance them. And then once the Americas were discovered and we got trade again with North America, this is where we start to see tomatoes being added into it over in North America. And so we get what we think of more like what we think of today as ketchup, a nice thick red sauce that is sweet and sour and has some umami to it. So, and starting off in China, we get brined or pickled fish, essentially, fish sauce. And that you can see the derivation of the word ketchup and how we have eventually got there. Kochap or kechap, um, and I'm probably completely slaughtering those, but um, that's what we started off with in China. Malaysia was kechap or kechap cap. Um, and then eventually in England, we start to hear what we are now calling ketchup. Okay, so we start off with this brine pickled fish in England. We get our word ketchup where we first hear it, but what we're talking about at that point is mushroom ketchup, and you'll see that here. Um, compared to the nice bright red ketchup that we have, this brown paste is not that appetizing. I must admit, I love mushrooms, um, but this doesn't look that great. Might taste wonderful, but it doesn't look that appealing. Um, so that was 18th century ketchup starting off there. So how do we get from this thin, brown, bitter, umami, intense um, fish sauce to what we think of now as thick, smooth, red, sweet, and sour ketchup? How do we get there? In 1817, this is a recipe that was written in 1817 for tomato ketchup. Um, so this was from the United States. It, mixed, it, it called for mixing tomatoes and salt and letting them rest for three days, and then pouring off the juice. Boiling um, these tomatoes with the juice removed with anchovies, um, shallots, 
and a big dose of black pepper, and then adding in more spices, allspice, ginger, nutmeg, coriander seed, and conchineal. Remember, conchineal was that red um, insect that we can add to foods to give that red-pink color. So um, they were even adding color enhancement at this point. Um, and what you see in the spices and the basic flavors that go into this is not only ketchup or not only tomatoes, but we get a lot of those brown spice flavors um, that you may not really associate with ketchup, but they're there, right? They're there in a very subtle mix. So all of these things were boiled together, simmered, and then canned um, until so that they could be shelf stable until ready to use. Um, in the 1850s, we start to see anchovies being removed. Um, and if you're not familiar with anchovies, anchovies are often added to foods to add a lot of umami flavor. In fact, if you like Worcestershire sauce, this is anchovy based. And there is a lot of umami or free glutamate in those that, that Worcestershire sauce. So in the 1850s, anchovies were removed, sugar started to be added. And in 1876, Mr. Hines launched tomato ketchup. So keep in mind, at this point, you didn't go to the store and buy a, tom a bottle of tomato ketchup, right? Or a, a bottle of ketchup. This was something that everybody, each household, had to make for themselves. Um, so in 1876, right around the time that Industrial Revolution starts to get moving in the U.S., we see Mr. Hines launching his first bottled tomato ketchup. Um, and and the, the marketing line for this was a blessed relief for mother and other women in the household. Um, so really they were taunting the convenience or they were um, promoting the convenience of this product because it's already made and bottled for you. So let's think about food preservation here. What prevents microbial growth in foods? Now remember back, we've talked a lot about food preservation and remember that we're not only trying to prevent um, spoilage organisms from growing, we're also trying to prevent pathogenic organisms from growing. So we don't want to make people sick, and we want to make that food last as long as we can on the shelf, right? So in order to do that, one of the first things we talked about in this class is acidic conditions, making sure that pH is below 4.6, and that way we prevent Clostridium botulinum growth, which is a big one. In heated foods, canned foods, in an anaerobic environment, we're trying to prevent that. So Low pH, low water activity can also do this. Remember, if we're below 0.6, we're not going to have any microbial growth whatsoever, no mold, yeast, and bacteria, most definitely not. And then the last thing is that we can inactivate these um, microbes. So by heating foods, uh, we could inactivate them by applying high pressure. We can inactivate them, all of these different things. So... Let's think about our recipe from 1817. What preserves this recipe? All right. If you look at this list, one of the things that's preserving this recipe is salt. This is a lot of salt, right? And we're pouring out a lot of the liquid, so we've got a very high salt concentration there. This is going to lower the water activity. So there's not going to be as much water available for microbial growth there. We're also heating this. So we're boiling, when then we're adding spices back in, simmering it after we have removed a lot of the um, bigger chunks of material. We're adding spices, simmering it, and bottling it. So we're actually thermally processing this product to um, help reduce the microbial load as well. So let's think about this. That's a lot of work for a home kitchen. What happens at the turn of the century is that we start to see people being very concerned about the things that are being added to their food in order to preserve it or prolong the shelf life, right? And this is, that, this is Harvey Wiley. Remember him? Um, he is the father of the USDA, the modern USDA and FDA, and um, he is the one that had conducted the... Um, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I can't remember the word. The, the meals where the, the guys um, ate the different products that were toxic to them um, and tried to determine the level of toxicity, how much could be consumed prior to becoming ill. 
Um, so this was what insta or what instigated, promoted the Pure Food and Drug Act. Finally, got it passed in 1806. Took decades to make that happen. All right. One of the things that they tested was sodium benzoate. Now, this is a, a chemical that is used today in products. It works really great in acidic environments um, to prevent mold and yeast growth. And ketchup is one of those acidic environments. And it was used in that day and time to prevent mold and yeast growth in ketchup. The thing was that no one did any tests to see how much was toxic to people or how little was needed in order to make sure that we're not getting mold and yeast growth. So there was no real use recommendations or requirements. So most purveyors of ketchup back then, if they had a sauce in a bottle that they sold in a grocery store or a convenience store, they, they used sodium benzoate and they used a lot of it. So once this rule was passed that we can only use so much sodium benzoate in a product, um, once that law was passed, people had to become a little bit more creative. And Henry Hines, pictured here, was one of those people who became more creative. So he used food science to create what we think of as ketchup today. And we're going to walk through that process of making ketchup the Henry Hines way. Um, because Hines ketchup is still the top um, market share of ketchup. Okay, So we talked about what preserved this recipe. Henry Hines said, okay, fine. We've got this basic ketchup recipe. I'm going to add in sugar and vinegar, all right? Now think about this from a preservation standpoint. Sugar and vinegar are both preserving agents, sugar dealing with water activity and vinegar dealing with pH. So this is Heinz ketchup um, of today, and here's your ingredient statements. Notice that we start with tomato concentrate, okay? So that makes sense. That's the main ingredient. The second ingredient on this label is distilled vinegar. The third ingredient high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup, then salt. All three of these within the top four ingredients, remember, because that means that they're um, higher in concentration, the higher up they are in the list of ingredients. All three of these, um, three out of the four ingredients in this ingredient statement, the first four, are all about preservation, okay? Still vinegar, we're lowering the pH so that it is shelf stable. We're um, adding sugar to this, right? High fructose corn syrup and corn syrup. And in fact, um, tomato ketchup is pretty sweet nowadays. And then salt. Also, uh, both of those sugars and salts are going to act to lower the water activity and help control uh, microorganism growth. Now, this, this ketchup is heat processed as well, but the ingredients, we're just looking at the ingredients. There's a lot in there that helps preserve it. All right, so how do we get from tomatoes, beautiful red ripe tomatoes that have seeds and pulp and skin and all kinds of things in there that are different textures to this smooth, thick red sauce? So the first thing that's going to happen is we have to make that tomato concentrate. That was the first thing on that label for Heinz ketchup. Wash the produce, remove the seeds and the skin stems, and crush the tomatoes. Once we get those completely pureed and crushed and all this, the, the non-homogenous parts removed, we are going to heat that tomato puree, right? We're going to drive off a lot of the water and concentrate um, the tomato solids that are there. Then add our other ingredients, heat it up to make sure everything is solubilized, homogenize it to make sure it's nice and smooth, pasteurize it to make sure it's safe, hot fill bottling, and then cap and cool. So let's walk through these different steps and how it is affecting the product and its safety. So we go from watery to thick ketchup, right? This is thick and smooth. So by removing a lot of that water from the tomato pulp and creating tomato concentrate, we are actually increasing the viscosity of this solution because now we have all kinds of little bits of um, cellular material from the tomatoes suspended in a little bit of water, right? Um, the other thing we're doing is releasing those polymeric carbohydrates from their cellular structure, the cell walls. So remember that we have pectin and cellulose and hemicellulose in our cell walls. The pectin is the nice green squiggly things. The hemicellulose 
is connecting the, um, the large yellow rods here that are cellulose. So when we heat up um, fruits and vegetables, that cell wall begins to soften and the pectin and hemicellulose are solubilized. Um, when we start breaking up cells even more, now we have cellulose that's free um, in the solution as well. So all of these things help to increase that uh, viscosity of our final product. Next, we're adding in our preservation ingredients, vinegar, sugar, and salt. Don't forget that these, not only do these things preserve, but they do add a lot of basic taste and flavor. All those spices in there add the flavor. Um, vinegar and sugar and salt, all of these basic tastes really work best when they're in balance. Um, Chinese cooking is one of the best uh, things to look at about taking all of these basic tastes, including bitter and umami, and making them all balanced and using them to the benefit of the food and making it really rounded um, as far as flavor goes. In this case, we're trying to do that same thing, balance sweet and sour and salty, okay? So we're adding in those ingredients. Keep in mind that sour and sweet are a result of adding acid and sugar, um, but also we're making sure that we're below this 4.6 cutoff um, for our bacterial growth or our microorganism growth. You can see that this is a graph of where different organisms like to grow. Molds are the most tolerant of different pHs. Yeast are, are pretty tolerant. They have a wide range of pHs that they will bat. Um, and that's not all yeast. Some, it's all species of yeast. And so some can really exist at low pH uh, much better than others. When we start looking at bacteria here, you can see that most of the bacteria that we talked about that are pathogenic, like Listeria, E. coli, Clostridium botulinum, um, Bacillus cereus, Shigella. Um, you're not going to find Shigella in um, tomatoes, but Clostridium perfringens. All of these types of um, organisms that can be pathogenic really prefer to exist somewhere between 5 and 9 pH of five and nine. So once we get below a certain acidity, and that's that 4.6 cutoff that Clostridium botulinum is at, we're doing pretty good. We're, we, we're knocking out a lot of these potential pathogenic organisms that can grow. All right, so we've added our ingredients. We're heating it up to make sure that all of those ingredients are solubilized really well. Um, we wanna make sure with that heat that we're thinking about our color. Very often, color is affected by heat. So this is um, a graph of the pigment concentration it, moving from a mature green tomato to a ripe red tomato. And remember that chlorophyll is the compound that uh, colors our green fruits and vegetables, right? As we mature, that chlorophyll starts to break down in the tomato and lycopene, which is a carotenoid compound, right? So this is that fat soluble compound that we talked about, it is a, a hydrophobic compound, it begins to increase in the tomato. So we see a big color shift here um, moving across that. Now, not only that, we are heating this product and homogenizing this product, okay? So this heating and homogenizing not only has to do with the texture, but it also has to do very much with the color Remember we talked about um, lycopene being crystalline structure within the cell walls of the plant. Um, so when we start to heat this product up, those cell walls start to break down and that lycopene becomes more available and more visible to our eye, it becomes a more intense color. Furthermore, if we homogenize it, now remember other products besides milk get homogenized, but milk is the one we've talked about homogenization with to make sure that we are getting all of our fat globules to be um, equal in size and that distribution is very narrow in, of sizes is very narrow. So what happens in a homogenizer is our product goes in and this where it's being forced through is called the valve seat. This is the valve that moves back and forth. And so we're forcing this material through a very tiny opening, right? And forcing it to make a turn. So when it does that, this impact ring is hitting the side of the impact ring and then exiting. 
Um, and what this has a tendency to do, because this creates a big pressure differential, we're breaking up whatever large particles are here. And in ketchup, that's cellular material. So homogenizing this product creates a more intense red color because we're really breaking down that cellular material, right? Any little chunks of, of, of pieces is left from the tomato. It also has the um, effect of creating a very thick sauce as well as very smooth. So it's taking any particles that your tongue might detect and breaking them down to very tiny pieces where your, your palate is not going to detect those pieces anymore. Um, so by creating all of these little tiny particles in um, solution, we're creating a sol. Remember the colloidal um, systems we talked about, foams, um, emulsions, and sols. This is a sol. So a, a solution of suspended particulate material. Um, you don't want to open your ketchup bottle and see a bunch of water at the top. And this homogenization keeps that from happening. It keeps those particles that are in the ketchup from being so large that they settle. All right. So we've got it homogenized. We pasteurize it to make sure that we have not, um, that we are killing a lot of those microbes there and most definitely pathogens. Remember that we're already at acidic pH. So this is actually... Um, banking in two different things. And remember, that's called hurdle technology, where we're adding um, different steps that are making it more and more difficult for microbes to grow, uh, for any type of microorganisms to grow. The last step is hot fill bottling. Now, we talked about this in conjunction with retort processing, right? Canning. So hot fill bottling is a possibility for acidic products, and tomato ketchup falls into that category. So what's happening is um, the bottles are washed, remember, and the product is heated, so it's pasteurized, it's hot, and it's going into those bottles and sterilizing the bottle. You invert the bottle to sterilize the lid, and that's hot fill bottling. All right, so we've got multiple steps that are going on in order to preserve this ketchup. Um, so once we get it hot filled in a package, we can package it in so many different ways. Um, you may have been to Chick-fil-A. I think they're the ones that typically have this type of container where you can open the entire thing um, and dip your french fries in, or you can pull the top off and squeeze it out of there um, like a bottle. This is the old fashioned, been around for ages, little packet of ketchup that you get with most of your french fries. And then of course, if you go to the grocery store, you'll see this squirt bottle. This squirt bottle in and of itself was a pretty huge innovation in packaging um, because it kept, if your, your ketchup did sell, se separate, excuse me, it kept the solid ketchup on the bottom nearest the outlet um, when you opened it. And so you didn't have a big squirt of water or pour out a big, um, a big drop of, of liquid from the top of the ketchup when you opened it. Um, you can also package this, we talked about this, with um, aseptic processing, particularly packaging in larger containers. Because this is hot fill, we can do that as well. This larger plastic container and then pouches as well are an option. Um, this one in a restaurant or institution, you can put this um, little nipple right on the dispenser and, it, and you don't have to cut it open or any of those things and pour. It's a very sanitary method of making ketchup available in smaller quantities from a large um, package. So there's lots of different packaging op options here um, that, that can be used. So counterfeit ketchup paper. This sounds incredibly silly, right? But in 2012, this is something that happened. So in 2012, there was a big push for um, reduction of use of high fructose corn syrup in products. Consumers were demanding this from food processors. And as you saw on the Heinz label, high fructose corn syrup is one of the ingredients. So Heinz reformulated their product and um, used sucrose instead of high fructose corn syrup. And so they, they reformulated the product. And because there was more demand for this product and they had to add in a different ingredient, sucrose in particular, um, instead of the cheaper high fructose corn syrup, they were able to sell this, 
this product for a slightly higher profit on the market. And it was called Simply Ketchup or Simply Heinz. So this product was on the market. And so some, some near do wellers decided that they would make an additional profit by taking bottles um, that had normal ketchup in it or it had simple um, or that Okay, so that what they did is they took the normal ketchup and they bottled it with the Simply Heinz label, except they didn't bottle it properly. They didn't heat the product up, so they just took it and put it right into the took the normal ketchup and put it right into those bottles that said Simple Ke Simply Ketchup, right? And they put it in a warehouse. They were gonna uh, distribute it and sell it. So after several weeks here in this warehouse, people that passed by started to notice a strange smell and a sticky red liquid oozing out of the warehouse and lots of flies. Um, and so what happened was that the bottles exploded. So these uh, thieves were not using the proper technique to make sure that the, the uh, ketchup was um, going into sterilized bottles and there was contamination of the ketchup when transferring it into these bottles. And the ketchup actually underwent fermentation, CO2 was produced, and the bottles exploded and oozed out. Um, and so the thieves, their whole idea didn't work out too well. There was not a whole lot of profit there. All right, so packaging as well as processing is really important in food preservation. Something that we haven't really talked to about at this point is a line extension. And in business, especially with food products in particular, this is really important. Um, food products all the time, a specific brand will come out with a new product. And they use the, the brand name in order to introduce something that's just slightly different. So this Easy Squirt Ketchup came out around 2000. Um, it was... It, a time when the Shrek movies had just come out and they premiered this new Easy Squirt ketchup um, with this green color first to align with uh, the um, Shrek movies. Now, you'll notice that it has the Heinz name. It says Easy Squirt, funky purple. Do you see the word ketchup on here at all? It's, there isn't the word ketchup, right? And that's because ketchup, remember, has a standard of identity. So that standard of identity was not met because they had to reformulate this product to get it to have these crazy wild colors. Um, so th this product came out and it's a line extension because they're using the brand um, loyalty here or brand name, the, the uh, popularity of the brand name to promote this new product and to sell it alongside the former product, right? And usually it is not a completely new and different product. It's just a twist on that product that's known. Heinz is known for ketchup. And so they're putting a new twist on uh, ketchup by coloring it these fun and wacky colors. Um, and it was really popular with kids for a very short time. However, it completely flopped because that short window where it was really popular didn't last. Um, they came out with other colors like teal and orange it just didn't go anywhere, okay? Um, kids have a really short attention span. There's other issues because these were all um, colored with intense food coloring. Um, and so moms are pretty health conscious oftentimes and that didn't float with them very well. They were very um, put off by consistently buying a product that had so much color added to it when there is a product that is naturally colored right beside it. Um, so that didn't go very well. This was a line extension that didn't work out that great. But Heinz is, is pretty famous for coming up with new um, products and new ideas. And most recently, last year, they came out with these mixes of different condiments. So mayo must, as you might guess, is a combination of mayonnaise and mustard. Mayo chump, mayonnaise and ketchup. And mayo Q is mayonnaise and barbecue sauce. Um, if you go to the grocery store, you may see these on the shelf. Uh, I've, I've seen them even in stores, in big box stores like BJ's now. Um, 
in the past year, they have grown the market in that way. So Heinz is really, uh, really good at coming out with line extensions of their products, um, especially something that you think of as tried and true like ketchup. They're really good at coming out with new ideas and line extensions um, to increase their share of the market. Last year was Heinz 150th anniversary. Um, and they released this product, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, this is some great food chemistry and product development. They released 150 jars. So it's called Ketchup Caviar. Caviar is a high-end luxury product to be sure. Um, and so the fact that they released 150 jars follows that, that type of thought process that this is a high-end luxury product uh, that could command a pretty high price. You see it here. It's like little droplets of, of um, red ketchup, right? Little balls of red ketchup. The way that they did this is using food chemistry. So sodium alginate is a, a carbohydrate polymer that when you combine it with a calcium product, it causes a gel. Now, if you've been to some of the uh, frozen yogurt places that have all the different toppings for you laid out, and they have the little bubbles of different fruit juices like mango or raspberry or strawberry. You get these little bubbles and they burst in your mouth. They have a little elastic shell and they burst in your mouth and are liquid in the center. This is the same idea. And it uses the same sodium alginate and calcium to cause the outside to gel. So what you do is you add that carbohydrate polymer, sodium alginate to whatever liquid you've got. In this case, it would be your ketchup. And then you squirt out droplets into a solution of calcium. And as those droplets of fluid sit in that solution of calcium, a gel forms on the outside and you can scoop those out, sieve them off, and now you have your product. So pretty inventive line extension for their 150th anniversary. So I hope looking at ketchup has um, shown you all the different things we've talked about from food chemistry to processing and preservation, to marketing, <coughs> excuse me, to color, that's your food chemistry coming in there. I'm talking about colloidal systems, salts. There's just so much that goes on in any one product that you choose off the shelf. Um, and ketchup is a great one to look at overall. So um, think about next time you go in your pantry, you may not be going to the grocery store quite as much nowadays, but next time you go in your pantry, Whatever food product you're picking up, whatever packaged product you're picking up, look at that label. Look at the ingredients. Think about what's preserving that product. How can it be on your shelf in the pantry and not um, spoil and not make you sick? Um, try to do that when you're, you're making dinner this evening or lunch for that matter. Um, think about your products in a deeper way than what you may have all right, so I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend, and I will see you next week.